foundational truths. What is God's master plan? Paul describes it in this way. He says, God needs to have or wants to have a people for himself and for them to live out the life of God on the earth. That's it. It has always been that way coming down the Old Testament. So the church is God's supreme end in his saving work. We need to understand that because we are in a church age. It is God's final effort to bring people to himself. That's what he's doing. The church must not fail. It must not fail. It is not an afterthought by God. It's not an afterthought of God's behalf. It was God's express intention hidden in God to use the church as the last and ultimate means of bringing people back to himself. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 says, To this intent, that now unto the principalities and powers or authority in high places, it might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God. The word Paul uses to describe the wisdom of God here is the word Paul Pokilos. P O L U P O I K I L O S. And it means many colors, variegated. It is the same word that has been used to describe Joseph's colorful coat. It's a coat of many colors. So when we talk about the wisdom of God, we need to understand that it speaks of many colors. It's variegated, multicolored. This is the word that is used to describe flowers, crowns, and clothes. Here Paul tells us that the church is to display God's wisdom. God's purpose has been revealed to include salvation for people in every nation, every tribe, every town, every language. That's why the church is multiracial. It is multi-ethnic. It is multi, it's a multicolored society. It's a community that has come together. And it is life that fills the local church that becomes the key transformational point for us to reach the world. It is a life that fills up the church. So we are placed in the very plan and the body of Christ to fulfill that purpose. That's where we are. The church, therefore, is the vehicle that has been used to demonstrate to the world his love and his redemptive power. That we has to come to. The church belongs to God. It is head by God, Jesus Christ. It is his church. It is in his body that we are set. We need to understand. So whatever we do that is against the church, it is against the body of Christ and it is against Christ. Simply. John chapter 1 from verses 35 to 42, we are not going to read it, but Andrew met Jesus. And after he met Jesus, he, he, he ran to bring, find his brother Simon and he brought him to Jesus. And as Jesus saw Simon, he changed his name to Peter. Simon means a reed, a reed in the water, one that can be easily swayed, one that can be blown with the wind, one that is unstable, one that can be easily influenced. What Andrew brought to Jesus was a reed in the wind, a very unstable man. A man that is moved with the whims and the fancies of the world. One who can be easily, there is no stability in him. And Jesus looks into Simon's heart and he says, Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. He says, you will become a rock. 
Because in that rock there will be stability, there will be foundation, there will be strength. You will no longer be known as a reed. You must be known as a rock, one that is stable. Jesus saw in Peter what Peter could not see in himself. He saw it. The failure of churches is that we do not see in ourselves what God sees in us. You understand? We do not see in ourselves what God sees in us. And so we have to come into that place. The Bible uses a word that we are familiar with, the word ecclesia. It was not a word that was invented by Christians, but rather it was a common Greek word that was used to describe public gathering. But it was a public gathering with a purpose in mind. They had a common purpose. So in Athens, the ecclesia would have met twice a week to discuss civil affairs. It was a gathering of people, but they had, they had one purpose. They gathered to discuss civil affairs. In Sparta, in Sparta, an ecclesia of soldiers would gather together that was commonly known as Spartans. They gathered together to train. They gathered together to develop themselves in armory and in weapons uh, and in skilled in becoming a good soldiers. We would have seen the show of the Spartans. They were very skilled fighters. They, they, they know how to maneuver in the battlefield. The Ecclesia later become a very religious word when, when scholars who translated the Old Testament use this to translate two Hebrew words. That's the word Ida and the word Qual, Q-A-H-A-L. What was in the mindset of the scholars when this translation was done? First of all, they understood that the Ecclesia, this gathering of people, had no spectators. It was a gathering of active participation. You cannot come as an Ecclesia or come as a soldier and decide, I'm going to just watch what's happening. You have to get involved. So we have to understand that the Ecclesia, the body of people coming together, there was no spectators. Secondly, it was not, the Ecclesia was not designed to be a religious event. It was a gathering of common purpose with aims and objectives. If we gather together, we must understand what's the objective, what's the purpose, what's the aim. So it was gathering together a community of people that had aim, had objective, had purpose. But the Ecclesia was a gathering that initiated change. They dealt with law. They dealt with the word. They initiated the change, change in mindset, change in culture. The Ecclesia became a living organism. It was a partnership of people that joined together. It was a partnership of people that came and joined together. And so when the word Ecclesia is used in the scripture, it speaks about God fitly joining together, join with join, marrow against marrow. He's, he's creating a body that has to be fitly placed together so we can function in unison. The Ecclesia was not about building or was, it was not about geography. It was not about place. It was about the people. They initiated change, they changed mindset. It was focused on people. And the word in that New Testament, Ecclesia, church, it was not defined by its size. A lot of times we have a misconception that the effectiveness of any church is based on its size. And a lot of time we want to get into large churches 
because we have things in our lives that we want to hide that we don't want other people to know. You don't need to say amen. There are a lot of folks that will not go into a community church because people know their life in the community. So they will go in another church outside and particularly large churches because they can hide among the congregation of people. A lie? So there was the church in Rome, in the region. There was the church in the home. There was the church in the city. There was church in the region. There was the church of the world. We don't generally plan church. We set church in motion. That's what we do. So what do we want? It's a backdrop. We want to build a strong and influential church. It makes absolutely no sense to establish a house and it has no influence. There is no change that has taken place. We are not able to bring change and mindset and culture and attitude and behavior. We are not able to mature people into a place. Uh, what you have just designed is a social club. We might as well come together. And that's, that's what people focus in. Let's come together and let's just have fun. Let's eat, let's drink, let's be merry. There is no change. What you have is a social club because there is no word. How do we develop strong churches? How do we develop and establish influential churches? Where well, we're going to start by looking at some truths. So I'm going to take you back to 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, if you will, with me. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. I'm going to read it through, and then after we're going to come back. So let's look at the scripture. And it fell in a day that Elisha passed to Shimon, where was a great woman. Underline that in your Bible, a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so. That as often as he passed by, he would turn in thither to eat bread. As often as he would come, he would go in and have a meal with her. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passed by us continually. Next verse. Let us make a little chamber. I pray thee on the wall. And let us set it for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick that it shall be when he come to us, he shall turn in to the. Now let's go back to verse 4. And let's hold on verse 4 for a while. This is a Shunammite woman. She's a Shunammite woman. She comes from the tribe of Issachar. History will tell us that she seems to be a well-off or wealthy woman. And every time that Elisha would pass by, they would invite him in to come and have a meal, come and have fellowship. And he would have passed a few times for the year. And she perceived, she tell herself, that this is indeed a man of God. So she counseled with her husband and says, this is a man of God. Let us build a room and let us set it in place so that we can go beyond of just giving a meal. We can give him a place to rest. He can overnight. He can stay. He can be comfortable. This is a traveling prophet. I want you first of all to realize here, Keep to the back of your mind that we are building strong houses and I want you to see the spirit of this Shunammite woman. First of all, the Shunammite woman is very perceptive. She is observant. She sees the need with respect to the man of God and she decides to address it. It is not that the man of God is coming and asking for a meal. It is not that the man of God is coming to say, I need some way to stay. The Bible says that in her spirit, having had fellowship, having seen this man, she perceived that this is indeed a man of God. And there is a need here. And I need to address this need. Are we getting this? 
So she goes and decides to address the need. And how does she do this? The very first thing she does is she goes to her husband. She goes to her husband. Next verse. Verse 9. And says, I perceive that this is a holy man of God which passed by us continually. This is very significant. Why does she go to her husband? Because her husband is her covenant partner. Follow me here this morning. She goes to her husband because her husband is her covenant partner. When you decide to do something for God, when you have a vision or you have a heart to do something, the very first person that you must look for is someone who can covenant with you. If you don't go to the person who covenants with you, they will destroy your dream. They will destroy your vision. They will not see what you are seeing. A covenant person understands your heart and they are able to walk with you. They are able to come into agreement with you. So why does she go to her husband? Because her husband has her best interests at heart. When we get into a marriage, we get into a covenant relationship. And that's why the scripture says the two shall become one. How does the two become one? The two become one because they are covenanted. They made an agreement. They said the, their vows and out of that vow, they agree that we are going to walk and live together with the same purpose and the same objective. We are going in the same direction in life together. If there is not a covenant, if there is not an agreement, if there is not a, a place where you come, where you understand where we are going together, then what happens? One person goes this way in the marriage and the other person goes that way. That's why marriage is a covenant. Covenant brings you into the understanding that we are going the same direction. We have the same objective. We have the same purpose. So what is the very first thing she do? She goes to her Husband, because her husband is her covenant partner. Find the people first thing when you want to establish a house who knows how to covenant with you. Because you are going to say, I am ready to build and they don't have your heart and your spirit. So what does this Shunammai do? She has the giftings. She has the discernment. But she do not have the ability to bring it to pass. So what does she need? She need first of all to find the person that can covenant with her. That sees with her that this is a man of God. And then she says, let us, next verse, verse 10. Let us make a little chamber. Here is discernment. Here is perception. Here is vision coming together to covenant with giftings and skills and talent in order to accomplish a purpose. Have you seen this? She can have all the discernment she wants. She can pray and fast about it. But unless she comes into a place where she is able to covenant with somebody that has the giftings, the talents, that has the skill to get it done, it cannot get done. You see, her husband didn't have the discernment. Her husband was just satisfied with, I have given the man of God a meal. And sometimes we can reach to the place where we are just satisfied with giving a meal. Because we don't have the discernment to go beyond the meal. A meal puts me into a comfortable place because it's a one-off gift. It's okay for me to come Sunday morning to give an offering. But when you talk about paying a tithes, you're treading on something different now. And could I remind you, if you are not tithing, you have just caused the enemy to devour your finances. You have caused that, not God. In essence, you are telling the enemy, come and take how much you want. 
So she needed a covenant with somebody who has that. He has the skill, but he has no discernment. So he needs her vision. What are you seeing, woman of God? I am seeing that we need to build a chamber. And I'm seeing these are the things that we need to put in the chamber. He has the skill to do it. So he's saying, let us do it. Because if you only have the vision, I cannot do it alone. We need to work together so we need a covenant and we need to come into agreement so it can be accomplished i know how to build tables but i don't know what kind and type of table you want you need to let me know what do you want as a table are we seeing this this morning so they need to come together let us come together let us come together in must tree tree. How can two walk together except they agree? Except they agree. There is strength that is found in agreement. Take a note of that. Where there is no agreement, vision dies. Where there is no agreement, purpose dies. Where there is no agreement, uh, all the desires that you have dies because there is strength that comes into agreement. You want to kill gossip? You stop agreeing. You want to make it live? You continue to agree with it. Hello? Somebody call and tell you something and you agree with that. And that's what agreement does. Agreement gives life. Agreement propels it. So whether it is negative or is positive, the moment you come into a place where I agree with what you are saying, I have just covenanted with you. That's what you did. I have just made a contract with you. I have just come into agree. And so when I come into agree with you, I am, what I'm saying is that what you see and what you say, even though it may be emotional, it may be, even though it may be coming from your soul, I have just locked into what you are saying. I've covenanted with you. That same spirit is going to come on you. So you're going to be no different. That's why the, the birds of the same feathers flock together. They have the same spirit, same attitude, same behavior. Nothing changes. Why? Because it's a covenant agreement. So if you keep speaking negative things and, and talking negative things and have negative attitude, when you covenant with those people, it's the same way you are going to get on. You're not going to be different. And you know the saying, show me your friends and I will tell you who you are. A friend of my enemy is my enemy. So what happens? When you fuel something, it will grow, it will grow, it will grow. How do you kill it? I don't covenant with it. I don't agree with it. This is not in accordance to God's word. This is not who I am. My integrity is beyond that. And so I kill it immediately because I don't covenant with it. The, her husband could have said, no, we will not do that. Let's be satisfied with just giving him a meal. But what he says, she says, let us make a little chamber. And that is what marriage is about. Marriage is about let us do it together. It is not about you do it. We develop bad concept. You do it now, you do it, you do it, you do it. I've often realized that anytime a husband is doing work on the outside and a wife comes and stands to give support, he gains strength. But if she lock up inside watching TV and cover up in the bed, hello, and have the husband doing all the work outside, he lost strength. You know what I'm talking about. But you come outside. And you know what I'm talking about? And you stand up there and you says, let's finish it. 
They say, I'm feeling tired, you know, let's, and she says, let's finish it. Let's complete it. What happened? You gained strength and you said, let's finish it. You don't know nothing about welding or building or nailing or anything like that, but you are able to do it. We had to choose a color to the front and the guy says, what color you want to choose? I say, hold on a minute, let me call my wife. Because I know I'm going to choose a color and I'm going to hear about this until Jesus comes. <laughs> you understand? So let's, let's discuss this because that is not something you change. You understand? The, the, the paint is $400 a gallon. And when you put one gallon, you want to know where it's going. I, I, I say, you all throw away the paint. That couldn't finish there alone. You understand what's going on? So let's discuss this. Let's, cover, let's come into agreement because when it goes up, it is not a dicey color they put. No, dicey color we put. Smart, eh? Wisdom builds a house. <laughs> you know That's the color we put. You understand what I'm going on? So you have to come into a covenant agreement. Let us do it. What's, this, what's the spirit of this woman? This is a woman of wisdom. This is a woman of depth. This is a woman of perception. And I wish we could have some Shunammites in the house. I wish we could have women in the house who has depth in them. They know how to covenant with their husband. They know how to stand. They see things. They can say, come on, let's get it done. Let's do it together. This woman is from the tribe of Issachar. So when I read this and I saw what this woman is made of, of the character of this woman, the integrity of this woman, the strength of this woman, the discernment, her ability to see and to understand, her ability to be very perceptive, her ability to say, let's get things done, her ability to bring honor to the man of God. Where did she get this from? Well, she came from the tribe of Issachar. And let's go to Genesis chapter 49, verses 14 to 15. Are you ready for the word? Come on, we, we're getting excited here now. This is good stuff. Genesis 49, verse 14. Issachar is a, is a strong ass. He's a strong donkey. Jacob is prophesying. He's blessing his children. And each one is coming before Jacob. And when Issachar comes before him, he says unto him, Issachar, you are a strong ass. You are a strong donkey. Now that's a prophecy to get, isn't it? Imagine you come and a man of God says, you are a strong ass. And you say, God didn't show him that. That has to be from the devil. Come on. Aren't you glad, wife, that you can have a husband who is a strong ass? You, you look at the person next to you and says, all I want you to be is a strong ass. You, know, you, just, you can just be a strong ass for me. You understand? Crouching down between two burdens. This is very prophetic. Because if Issachar does not understand and discern the Shunammite woman, if he does not discern the blessing that the father is placing upon him, he will get offended and walk out of the blessing. But the father looks at him and says, you are a strong donkey. You, it, it, some version says you have a strong backbone. Crouch between two burdens. Continue. And he saw that rest was good. That is what it's such a so. We're going to up to verse 15. And the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. This is the ninth son of Jacob. It is the fifth son of Leo. And if you remember the story, you will understand that Jacob was um, in love with Rachel. And in return, he was out schemed by his father-in-law. Watch those father-in-laws. You understand? And he got Leah. Because in the eyes of his father-in-law, you have to marry the eldest first. 
So he gave him Leah, and he had to work again for another seven years because of his love for Rachel. But Rachel was barren. That's the problem. Very prophetic. Rachel cannot produce. You see, you could be in love with something that is not good for you. Hey, I told you these are good stuff. You can marry into things that will not produce the best out of you. She could not bring a son to Jacob. And if she could not bring a son to Jacob, then the name of Jacob could not be carried on. The lineage of Jacob would die. But he loved her. Let's, let's read some scripture. It's good to read it. Genesis chapter 30, verses 14 to 24. I want to give you the backdrop of this because this is quite exciting. Genesis 30 from verse 14. Let's go. Genesis 30, 3, 0. And we're reading from verse 14. 1, 4 from verse 14. Right? Track with me. Good. And Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest. So Leah has Reuben, which is one of her sons, and he goes out into the field. She, does, she, she, she is up to Reuben at this point of the game. Remember, she has five sons. And he found madricks in the field. And madrick is a particular plant, which is a particular flower. And he brought them unto his mother Leah. First of all, Reuben understand the significance and the importance of this plant. And it was like if he found treasure in a field, and when he found it, what does he do? He brings it to his mother to honor his mother. Now, let me, when, when I went and I, I looked at this, Madrick, right, is a flower or a plant that is used to assist in fertility. It is used to assist in fertility. Now Rachel sees that Reuben brings this flower. She knows the significance of the flower and she wants it because she is barren. Let, let's read this. Unto, and then Rachel said unto Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrake. Give me what he has. Because she, she, she really wants to have a son. This is going to help her. Next verse. And Leah said unto her, It is a small matter that thou hast taken my husband. War between women. You understand? It is a small matter that you have taken my husband. And wouldest thou now take away my son, Madrick, also? In other words, you don't take my husband, Jacob. We know he loves you. He's married to me. Now because you see my son brought this flower, this plant, you want the plant also. You know those kind of people. And Rachel said, therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son, Madrick. In other words, I will give you Jacob for the night. What a trade. This is a young and restless episode. You give me the flower, and I will give you my husband. And some husband feeling nice. They wish that could happen. You yeah, understand what's going on? You can, you can go into that. You would imagine by this time in the story that Jacob is not paying much attention to Leah because Rachel is whom he loves. So they strike a deal. You understand? Next verse. Jacob came out of the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and says, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I have hired thee with my son. Andrew. This is drama to the fullest. You understand? You have to come and sleep with me because I just paid. 
for you to sleep with me. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you never thought these kind of things would be in script here. And he laid with her that night. Let's go to the next verse. We're going up to verse um, 24. And God hacked unto Leah, and she what? Conceived. Where are we? I'm in verse 17. And bared Jacob what? The fifth son. So she got pregnant. She bared him a son. And Leah said, God has given me my hire. Because that is what he, she did. She said, he is hired. The name Issachar means reward, compensation, benefit, salary. Issachar was known as a man of hire. So his personality is that of a laborer. His personality is that of a burden bearer. I want, you to, I want you to see something that is coming out of this. Because of how Issachar was conceived, because of the schemes and the tricks and everything that was planned before that brought the conception of Issachar, it resulted in his very legacy of how he would live out his life. Be careful. And he said unto him, he will be a man of hire. I have given my handmaid to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. Continue. And Leah conceived and bear Jacob a sick son. And Leah says, God has endured me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me because I've borne him six sons. And she called the name of the next Zebulun. So she's trying to win the favor of her husband. And afterwards, she bears a daughter and call her name Dana. But God remembered Rachel. How many of you know that God don't forget you? How many of you know that sometimes you're in a place, but God remembers you? You don't have to stay there all the time. God remembers. Sometimes you feel that God has forgotten you. Sometimes you feel you are sad. Sometimes, but the moment Rachel come to a point where I am not going to fight against this. I'm not going to try to accomplish it in my own strength. God remembers Rachel. And God hearkened to her and what? Open her womb. This is quite significant. Because if God will open her womb, it means that her womb was shut. It means that a womb was shut for the design and the purposes of God. And he opened her womb and she conceived and bare a son. And she says, God has taken away my reproach. Verse 24. And she called his name Joseph. And said, the Lord shall add to me, what? Another son. Joseph means he adds from the roots. He adds from the roots. So when we track the life of Joseph, we will see that even though Joseph was sold into slavery, even though he came out from where under the roots, God raised him up because everything that has a strong root that is rooted will grow up to establish itself. Are we hearing this? She bears a son, calls him Joseph. Let's go back to Issachar, Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 11 and 12. How does God start to raise Issachar? What is the anointing of Issachar? What is the character and blessing of Issachar that comes down to the Shunammite woman? She calls, let's go to, did I give you that? Deuteronomy chapter 27, from verses 11 to 12. Six sons were chosen to bless people after they have crossed the Jordan. Six sons. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, verse 12, These shall stand upon Mount Gerzim to bless the people when you are come over the Jordan. Watch what what how God takes and moves and positions so that 
who was a hire, who was a laborer, who was a servant, who was meant to work the grounds, who was meant to carry burden, who blessing you would consider irrelevant. God raised up, and he says that when you come into over the Jordan, um, Sim Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Joseph, and Benjamin, these are the people that are going to stand to what? Bless the people. The Issachar nation, the tribe, the people, they are the people who became versed in the law. They are the people who became versed in the knowledge and the word of God. They are the people that God set apart and he established them. And because of their positioning, they have vision of the sea and they have vision of the horizon. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Pull those scriptures for me, verses 18 to 19. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 18 and 19. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. Verse 19. They shall be called people unto the what? Mountains. When you are positioned in the mountains, you have vision. When you are positioned in the mountain, you can see horizon. Positioning in the mountain is an established place. Position in a mountain is an exalted place. God will take the meek and exalt them. God will take those who knows to carry burden, those who knows to have humility, those who knows to submit under obedience. And the scripture says he will position them in the mountains. They are the people that will be established because they are the people at the mountaintops that will see a clear vision of the horizon. And he says, they shall be people unto the mountains, and they shall offer sacrifice of righteousness. They know worship. They know holiness. They know the word and the mind of God. So they come into a place where they can offer sacrifice of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the sea and the treasures hid in the sand. To find treasures hid in the sand, you have to look for it. So they are the seekers. They are the one who knows how to dig deep and get down onto the grounds and find the treasures of God and pull it out. These are the Issachar people. These are the character of the people. They are the one that draws from the abundance of the sea. And when we talk about the sea, we talk about the water, which is the word of God which is the anointing of God. There is a river that flows from the throne that flows down, and it talks about the, a water that flows. The scripture tells us that out of your belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. They understand how to draw out of the abundance of the sea. This is the character of people that we are looking for. This is not plain church. This is understanding an Issachar anointing. The Issachar anointing is people that picks up things in their spirit. Your lifestyle is to be, will be rewarded by others because you will be a blessing to others. You cannot be a blessing to others if you are not first a blessing within yourself. Because you cannot give what you don't have. Oh... Come on, are you hearing me this morning? So for Issachar to reach to a place where he says, you will rise up and bless the nation. It means to say that I already have treasures locked up within me. I already have blessing locked up within me that can flow over so that I can be a blessing to others. These are people that knows how to reward righteousness. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, I'm going to close. I won't be able to get into all of this. First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. Verse 32, 3 through. 12, 32. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the... Come on, read it with me. It was men that had understanding of the... 
of the times of the times if you don't have an understanding of the times that you are living in you will always be in the past you will always look back to the past this is how it used to be this is how i want it to be this is how it used to go you are not an it's a child it's a child's people of the times. they understand the times and the season that we are in they are perceptive they are discerning they know the move of god they know what god is doing now and they get into the bandwagon and say let's get it done i have shoulders that can take burden we come and we play church we come to fool people by coming to church but god knows the heart because what god needs is it's a child it's a child in the house he needs people that have an understanding of the time to know what israel ought to do the head of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their commandments they know how to covenant with people they know how to bring people together they know how to deal with the head and the tail they brought people together they know how to mobilize people together are you hearing me this morning this is revelation that we are talking about so when the shunammite woman comes and say let us build a room embedded deep within her spirit is what came out of a tribe you see what is in your spirit will show up hello you don't have to come i don't need a prophet to come and tell me what is in your spirit will show up i told him I, when i preach i don't drink water because i don't want to put water in my mouth when i'm talking for too long we play in church choke us church has become a joke it has become a movie theater we come with a set of performance. We want to see how good they could sing, how good they dress in, what the musician could do, what they could do. That is a performance. And nobody understands uh, that we need to come down, that we need to be the ass in the church. We need to be the crouching donkey that sits down, that knows humility, that knows submission, that knows obedience, that knows how to bow down and say, put the burden on me because I have strong shoulders. We want the position. But the higher you go, the harder you. Ay, ay, ay. It's about pride. Nobody is about humility. Nobody knows about saying, I'm sorry. It's about pride. You have to understand the time and you need to know what Israel ought to do. Judges chapter 5, I'm not going to go into it. Five tribes gathered together to battle against the Canaanites during the Borah times. Ephraim, Zebulun, Issachar, Naphtali, and Reuben. Um, and the others, Reuben, Gad, Dan, and Asher, was deprived for their lack of participation. The scripture tells us that God judged them because they did not participate. We have too much of pride in our heart. I'm not getting involved. I'm not associating. I'm standing back. Watch that pride. That is a devilish thing. Are you hearing me? That's a devilish thing. We need to come. A strong donkey is a sturdy animal. Could you go back to that, to that verse for me? Um, Genesis chapter 49, verse 14. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 14. He says, an Issachar is a, it's a strong donkey. And what is, what, what is the donkey doing? He's crouching. He, he bows down. He comes down. Why? Between what? Two burdens. He comes to a place of rest. This is what strong character is about. It speaks about spiritual strength. It speaks about his action. It speaks about I'm ready to shoulder responsibility. It is not just talk, it's about the walk. Hello? 
Now, if you can't take these meat that we are sharing, walk with your milk. Because we are, we, we are distributing meat. He bows down and he understands what the burden is. And he bows down to shoulder the responsibility. A place of rest, a place of divine grace. A place of total reliance upon God. When you come in total reliance on God, it's a place of faith. Man, we have exhausted the character of this Shunammite woman. So when she says, let us build. Locked up in her is a woman of faith. Locked up in her is a woman that knows how to crouch and humble herself. This is the man of God. Let's bring honor to him. And she knows how to do that because from the tribe that she comes, there is a character, there is a characteristics that come out of that tribe that is inbuilt within the woman. She is a strong donkey. And her strength is in her humility. Her strength is in her humility. It is not about me. I will crouch down and put the burden. Put it, Pastor. Put it on my shoulders. Come on, turn to that person next to you and say, all I need is a donkey next to me. Huh? If you can have one donkey, hello, you don't need 50 horses. They could be fast. But they can't carry the load. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They can be fast, but they can't carry the load. Let's go. You just need one donkey that has the humility, that has the strength, that is resilient, that can crouch down in humility and say, put the burden on my shoulders. This is the kind of people we need for building a strong house. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is the kind of people we need for building a strong house. We don't, know if you're, we don't want to know if you're carrying 50 names. We don't want to know how much degree you have and which school you go to and which university. That will add value as you begin to serve. That does not impress God. We don't want to know which position you used to serve and you're serving and all that kind of stuff. And oh, you, do you know that I was a supervisor with the government? Uh, well, I, like yesterday I was telling them guys, I said we should privatize the government. And we YouTube in this. You understand? We don't want to know all that. We want donkeys in the house. We want people that has a heart of humility, that knows how to bow down. We want people who understand what it is and, have an, and see the times, understand the times and set apart themselves for the time. Are you getting this? Not plain. Well, I, I come to church this morning because they go call me. That's our responsibility. We have a system where we follow up on you. So the pastor ought to call you every time. Well, if the pastor don't call, man, I am coming. Well, you will wait. Because I put a system for structure so that when the church reach bigger than where it is, when it begins to expand, when it begins to grow, you understand? We have a system to follow up. You, are you okay? Are you well? Are you this? Are you that? You understand? If you're still waiting, you are a racehorse. You, have, you only want to do one thing. You want to take off leave everybody behind and reach in the finish line first. That's all you want to do. But when you are a donkey, you are consistent. You're slow, but you're sure. You're carrying the burden. You may be going one step today and one step tomorrow, but you're sure you're going to reach because you're carrying a, a burden. Are we getting this this morning? 
These are the people we need in the house.